and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. As you know, we, you know, we like to talk rugby. And this week, as ever, there are lots of things to talk about because we've got a Super Rugby final with the Blues hosting the Chiefs. The Canes went down despite topping the table, so there's lots to unpack there. And then there's that thing we have every year where the All Blacks get named on the same weekend as the Super Rugby final. So <laughs> there's so much to fit in into an hour-long show. So let's get into it as quickly as we can, as well as SAV Wales, a Barbarians game, which is the end of Sam Whitelock's career. Your comments for the players' sports ball. So much to talk about. Next to me, we've done a bit of a swap here. Bryn Hall is in studio. Yep, good to be here. Yeah, yeah, great to have you here, of course. And then we've got James Parsons down in Christchurch. What's going on, guys? You just couldn't align. I just built a house. I think Jip is just having a look at it, aren't you? How was it? (laughs) Yeah, mate, beautiful. Uh, <laughs> took the boys around there. We 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 kicked things off for the Canterbury lads. Um, so we, we we've 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 uh, I suppose tipped the cap to your house. Did you get vacuuming afterwards or? No, nah, no. Nah, I thought um, Bryn Bryn could uh, come home to a bit of a mess, and you know, that'll keep him active and occupied. <laughs> Here's the details, man. I'm sure you like a vacuum, do you, Bryn? You are you a tidy yep. person? Yeah, yeah, I am. I am. And saying that, no, hang on, no. Just before, just before he gets in, just before he gets in, I actually am a tidy person. <laughs> I am a tidy person. My my partner can live towards <laughs> that, but and the the changing room locker next to Jipper. Yeah, it wasn't one of my better ones growing up. I must admit. Look at him just smiling there. He knows it as well. Terrific. He got similar treatment that my three-year-old gets. <laughs> <laughs> He's seen red every time we'd, he'd be walking in. He'd be, bro, mate, move that. Obviously, yeah. a few expeditives, maybe. But, um, yeah, I got the got it pretty done pretty early on. What was right. I, a 20-year-old kid, so. Yeah. I got there in the end. Wow, well, a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Probably say it wasn't and you can better. send the invoice to his partner. <laughs> I probably need to thank Sam, because it sounds like she's taken a more efficient approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good delivery. <laughs> Fair enough, too. All right, OK. So we've got plenty to talk about. Let's start, just break down the semi-finals as we look towards the final before we carry on into the All Blacks. Let's go chronologically, shall we? Make sure that it all works inside my head. The Canes. Last week you said it. You felt the Chiefs had a real good chance of getting up. You know, you felt deep down that that was something that could really happen. And it went that way. Why did it go that way? Oh, look, I think, you know, for some of the points that I did bring up, I thought, you know, their kicking game on the weekend um, is a really big strength of them. And I think having Sean Stevenson now, I actually thought would probably be a little bit of a hindrance knowing that he's got a real big kicking game. But I thought, you know, Cortez at our team in and around his contestable games, Damien McKenzie again, even Rami Kapoor, he'd be showing some exits and being able to kick long. They had 33 kicks again, which I think is a pretty good DNA. And 1,000 metres kicking seems to be a, the number that they tend to win games with. But I think at the same time, we can't underestimate that, that start. You know, look... After 15 minutes, you know, probably two tries. First one, Namoni Narawa's ability to be able to to be able to set up that try for Fina was unbelievable. And probably one of the reasons why he was selected as an All Black. And then, you know, a fortuitous bounce and then around a charge down. Wallace Atiti gets in and Cortez Ratima, who obviously has, has the best support lines in New Zealand at the moment, scores that try, 14 points, and then a penalty is given pretty much at the 15 minute mark. Damien McKenzie gets it to 17 0 And that, that's obviously a lot to happen within a 15 man in a 15 minute span. But look. When you sometimes do that, the Mike Tyson analogy in the comment is when you know you don't know how hard it is until you get smacked on the nose, and they got smacked on the nose quite early on with it being able to be under a lot of pressure. So I think with that, and then I think Jip has talked about a lot the turnover rate. You know they had what did they have here? Hang on, let me just look at my notes here. I think they had 16 Heron Handley errors and 12 within the first 52 minutes. So it has been a common trend that they have had, and look the the the, the, the Chiefs pounced on that, and then I think with even in the the 60th, the 55th minute when um, Brett Cameron scores his try, and then I think the yellow card with Jacobson, um, Wallace Atiti in that intercept was a massive play with them being able to get the result. Cortez at our team gets there quick, and they're able to get it to the edge. And I guess stunt that momentum because you know just before that, Morby, you know should probably score that try, and it ends up being 21-20 going into the last 15 minutes with Jacobson coming back on. So. They just didn't take the opportunities. Their high, their high turnover rate that Jip will probably touch on that he's said the whole year was a big factor. And the Chiefs were able to grit it out and get the job done in, in tricky conditions, in tricky conditions in, in, in Wellington. Did it surprise you, Jip, the way that the Canes got the yips a little bit? See, I don't think it is the yips. Like, you know, they just hadn't, I suppose, got so far behind previously in yep. the season. Um, for me, what I actually admired because even when they got behind, they kept playing their game. Like, they had a high turnover rate. But everyone's sort of spoken about that like it's a surprise. Like, they've had that all year. Uh, that's their game. They want a chance to run, and sometimes it comes off. And 
look, this season, you know, nine, ten times out of 12, it's, it's come off. Um, but it wasn't to be on the final. But there's also, um, I think Brendan alluded to it, the Chiefs kicking game. Um, I mean, our stats are a little bit different, but it doesn't really matter. The, the, the kicks were way more than the Hurricanes, and, and they just did that defensive pressure and putting um, the ball back in their hands, and they know the Hurricanes want to play. So then they just had to get good kick chase and, and really challenge it around um, the breakdown, force turnovers where they can. And um, the Chiefs are probably the best exponents and something that Blues will really need to be wary of is, is from turnovers. They honestly make you count. Like it's no surprise that Nawara got that ball inside to Fino. You know, like they when they get in behind defences, they do make it count. Um, so it, it, it's, um, you know, it's set up for a ding-dong battle. Um, and, and, you know, if the Blues are to give as many op- opportunities that they gave um, to the Brumbies, you know, it's, it's not all said and done, but they'll just clean this up at home. We've talked a lot around, around Ruben Love and his ability to be able to get the ball away on the edge. And look, if you look early on in the piece, the, the Chiefs put a massive amount of line speed pressure around the Hurricanes. And, you know, for most of the year, those passes have been able to get to the edge. But because early on, with how much line speed there was, um, you know, you have to think about situationally being down 17 points and maybe obviously with the wind conditions that were there, we weren't seeing those passes stick and then being able to then go on, on top of teams on the edge, you know, with like likes Moore, and then obviously you've got um, Larkai, um, Flanders, Shields and, you know, Duplessis Karifi being able to get it, go forward ball. So, yeah, I think the Chiefs' defence was, was really, really good and it's something that the Blues will have to look at, you know, and they'll talk around being a little bit deep, deep with their pivots and they'll have a kicking game strategy of what they want to do, but I was really, really impressed with the Chiefs and the line speed pressure that in, in, in really made it really hard for the Hurricanes to try and get around them. We've had a question come through from John Cooper, and it's a good one. Um, from an amateur's view, it seems the Hurricanes coaches used the same approach in the first half of both playoff games, which required precision in the passing game with a lot of flat, quick passing. The Canes' flow looked off, pushing for extra metres versus going down to keep momentum and not being aggressive on hitting holes. So was this maybe not the best strategy to continue with in, a, in the playoffs? Should they have come more to what we'd consider playoff rugby, Jip? Not for me, Ross. I, I don't think. Like, I think um, when you've spent that many weeks playing a certain style to change in the finals, could have they been more conservative? Um, I don't think they would have been there had they been conservative. So I think they went out swinging um, the way what they wanted to play. Could they learn from it? Yes, and I'm sure they will. We're having those discussions. We've got two sides in the final that have had to have similar discussions and, and learn from it, and, and both have... You know, made pretty impressive adjustments, um, particularly defensively. And, and we know finals, footy defence wins championships, and the Chiefs factory was all based off defence, either through, you know, kick chase and forcing turnovers, or Wallace Atiti doing um, an intercept and putting them in a position. Yeah, look, I just think off that as well, we've talked around in finals footy, it just comes down to a matter of moments, right? Like, so the, stuff, the whole year, They've been able to get that passway that I've referred to with Ruben Love. He's got probably the best distribution skills when it comes to fullback and putting that last passway in. And a lot of other players as well, even you look at Ray Arce hand in his hand, but the margin of error was so small when that comes back for a forward pass. So the only bad thing about it for the Hurricanes is that they will have, have the learnings, but there's no more weeks. The final's done, and it's, that's what's the great thing about player footy is you've got to try execute and get it right on the day. And also, if you're not, being able to adapt on the run, which the Hurricanes were able to do in a lot of those those moments they're able to get a bit of momentum and like I said with that Rona try or Rona try, they were, you know, making their way back into that game. But unfortunately, one thing in a play like Wallace Satiti, who's able to go to intercept and they score a try off that, it just seemed that the the Chiefs had a few opportunities and they took it. And that's the that's the beauty of the play of footy when you're able to try to get it right in, in high stress situations and the Chiefs were able to do that just a little bit better than the Hurricanes on the weekend. So it could be that the Canes are another year away from being that final team. John, we'll chuck you out the player's sport ball. Thank you very much for your question. Um, Jipper, do you have something else to add there? I was just going to say, like, I think people have become so accustomed to thinking, you know, once you're in the final or at home, like, it's just easy to win uh, because of the Crusaders' success. But what, I mean, I've said it before previously, what they did over that six-year spin is just incredible. Um, and it's And I stress again, these two teams... They've had to go through some hurt to get back to this final. And, and I think for the Hurricanes, uh, they had it good enough. They had a, a championship winning score uh, in coaching team this season. Yep, they didn't execute on the one night they would have liked to, to get themselves all the way there for a home final. Uh, I do think they'll be better placed. And, and 
the one nice thing from a fan's point of view is that the amount of teams that are contesting for the championship now in Super Rugby is is widening, uh, which makes it much easier to comp- uh, competition. And we are down to two now. The Chiefs, last week you said they could go away and win it. This week we're in a similar position. They're going to a team higher on the table. Yep. They did lose to the Blues, although at the end it felt like they won it because they stopped that bonus point try that stopped the Blues getting <laughs> top. All the same, we end up back at Eden Park yep. for the rematch with bad weather by the looks of it. The long-term forecast says Friday, Saturday, Sunday rain. Mm-hmm. Are the Chiefs set up to go to Blues territory and win in the wet? I think they're set up for it, whether they can do it or not. Um, I just don't think, you know, the, the weather conditions is probably a, a something, you know, that's all they need to do. Look, I think the way that the Blues are playing this year, the physicality is going to be really massive. Look, on the weekend, you know, they had a better um, game line percentage that they did against the Brumbies. We talked about that being a big part of that game against the Brumbies because it's what they're really good at. And they knew they had to come to Eden Park to try to get that done. So that tight, that tight five, that eight has to do a job against the Blues because, look, there's no secret. The Blues have done it the whole year, the DNA. You look at the first four, you know, the first 20 minutes and how much um, success they got into that 22 year. I think they had four entries and they scored four tries within that first 20 minute span. So, look, the Chiefs will know that they have to do that. But, like I said last week and throughout this year, if Sean Stevenson comes back into that um, into that team, it brings up the exit zones a lot, a lot easier and they can be able to. Um, kick those long metres and fine grass within the middle of the field or kicking it long in kind of the exit zone areas, which I think they've probably been the best um, more so in the last month that I think using the kicking game and, and being able to do that. And I thought also Cortez Aratima, his last probably three games, I think has put him into the conversation of being in that third in that third nine. I know he's, he's got very good support lines and his scoring tries, but look, ability in big moments in games, the contestable game that he has shown growth in, in that area and also the kicking long off nine. I think we're really crucial because Finlay Christie, I think he in New Zealand is the best uh, exponent of the box kick and being able to kick under pressure, which is going to be great for Blues fans in that um, in that quadrant with that weather coming. But I do think the, the Chiefs have the game to do it with that kicking element that I've just touched on, but also the physicality. They've got to win that, non-negotiable. But lastly, the way that they play in finals footy. They don't go away. Gyps, Gyps played against them a lot, played them in finals. They do not go away. So if it is tight through the experience of what they've had losing finals and the Blues as well. They're, both teams are in similar situations losing finals within the last two years. It's just been able to see very similar to the Hurricanes. Can you get the job done when the points are supposed to be there and in situationally in moments when the game's on the line, are you able to adapt and are you able to, to get the job done with what your role is in those last big moments? What do you think, Chip? You know the Chiefs are going to be in the fight. They're going to challenge in every area, but a couple of key stats, like the Canes did um, only allow 35% game line possession um, for for uh, the Chiefs. So they weren't always kicking on their terms. They kicked a lot, but not necessarily on t- their terms. So the more they can do that and put that kicking game of the Chiefs under pressure, especially in the wet, I think that'll be a key factor. Um, and then I suppose for the Blues, they got a little bit cute coming out of their half a few times at line-out time, um, uh, which caused a few turnovers and then discipline as well. Uh, piggyback the Brumbies into their territory. So I know they'll be focusing heavily on making sure they can control what they can control. And, and you know, similar to the Canes is, you know, they still want to play their game, but they they do want to be a little bit smarter, I believe, in their territory because they gave the Brumbies nine entries. Brumbies only scored on two occasions, but you give nine entries um, to the Chiefs, statistically it says they're probably going to pick up six tries. And then you really will be chasing your tail to, to try and win a final when you're having to score 45, 50. Chip, just sticking with you, Samasoni Taukiaho, you know, it looks like he's got a, a relatively serious Achilles injury. Uh, we saw also Slater got an injury and MCL might be available. Got Tyron Thompson as the backup, which, you know, is quite, is quite a good backup. Do you think that that plays a big part in this final, considering the strength that Taukiaho brings? Oh, man. I think if you've seen the way Tyron Thompson's played when he's been given those opportunity, he can play a very similar role. Um, you know, he hasn't had as many reps, um, obviously, in terms of the set piece at line-out time and scrum during the year. I don't mean just at game time, but even um, at training. So he'll need to get some clarity. And, and you know, like as Ben always says, for an attacking menu, it's no different for a line-out menu. Mm-hmm. Someone's coming in new, not only, you know, Tyron's not new, but, getting an opportunity to start, but then um, the, the new person who is coming into the squad is just simplifying that line-out menu. You've just got to win the ball. Quick throw-ins, um, you know, wet weather, you know, trying to be able to 
get the ball in and out um, and not not allow the Blues to enter the competition. You know, I, I hate to bring this back, Jip. You know, obviously when the Crusaders played the Blues and demoed that line how how hard it was for the Blues to try build that momentum and to try at least, you know, win the game through that. So it's not to say that the, the Chiefs won't do that, but it is an important part of the game to be able to win your set piece and have parity in the end. That's one thing also that I think the Blues have done really well this whole this whole year. When they've been in tight situations, they've been in tight games, they can go to that line out more, they can build a penalty off there. Harry Plummer's kicking at a pretty good rate to try and score points when you need those valuable points and their scrum penalties. They're able to be able to, especially in wet night, it's going to be honestly a battle of just being able to get scrum penalty, scrum dominance and wall line out malls. And when you're in that position of the 22, which the Blues have shown this year, they're not afraid to go to that 13, 20, um, 20 phase count of picking and going, um, cleaning long, going past the ball and, and, you know, almost submitting teams into defeat mm. with the way they do. So the Chiefs are going to have to be on there. So no doubt with Gypsy with the lean menu, they've been able to get there for Tyron coming in if um, Brady Slater isn't OK with that, with that knee. Um, it'll be a very important thing. And the Blues will be licking their lips knowing that, you know, there could be a little bit of um, kryptonite because obviously with the injury to um, Tokiaho. Now, we've got another good question through from Julian Neal on email, and you please email us, aotearoaragipod at sky.co.nz. He said, I had the pleasure of attending the Toulouse v Leinster final last month, and while it was an epic defensive performance from the French, it definitely felt that the better 10, 12, 13 midfield game from Leinster would have seen them home. Do you think that the 10-12-13 combination and smarts of the Chiefs can see them overcome the excellent defensive structure of the Blues this weekend? Oh, I think they can. I think any time you can have an experienced 10-12-13, uh, it helps. And, you know, they're pretty lucky, I think, the Chiefs in and around having David McKenzie, um, Anton Leonard Brown, even, you know, uh, Rami Kapohipi has been there for a couple of years now. Daniel Rohn is there. Quinta Pai is obviously on the bench. So there is a lot of consistency and a lot of depth within that, within that squad. But I think... It doesn't matter if you have a 10, 12 or 13, your full pack has to be able to, um, to win the upfront battle. If you're going through them on attack, you're not going to be able to play on top of them with what their face play shape and how tough it is to defend if those boys aren't going forward. Yes, you can go to your kicking game, but at the same time, you've got to win that collision. And so I think the Blues will be tested in and around that area, not just in you know the midfield or that kind of 10, 12, 13, but on the edges, if they don't get that um, defensive pressure and slow down that ball, but, you know, the whole year, the Blues have been in that 90, 92%. We've talked about what, what Craig McGrath's done with that group. And so it'll be tested, but I think, you know, it's going to be able to see who wins that collision. You know, Jipper talks about a lot going through them. You've got to go through them. You can't you can't cheat the system. There's no cheat code. If you don't get that right, you don't give yourself, yourself a chance. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. You're on the same wavelength there, Jipper? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think um, it's extremely hard to break down. The, and the Brumbies tried a lot of um, innovative things, a lot of chips in behind. But some of the work off the ball, um, and, and particularly by leaders, like Dalton Papali'i saved a certain try by working across the field. In behind the defence, when it had been broken down, Rico Iwani as well used his pace on a number of occasions when the Brumbies broke it down. So it's not only is it you've got to break it down, it's then the, I suppose, relentless attitude to it, you know, front up for each other. Chip, you know, probably you'd love, we love seeing this, is, you know, all the second, third, fourth efforts that, you know, you probably don't see on TV. Both these teams have that kind of DNA in them at the moment. The Chiefs have it, the Blues have had it. Look, even last week, Dalton Papali'i goes all the way back 70 metres, stops to try, gets a turnover, and has showed pitches of like that throughout the end. There's been a lot of them within the Chiefs in that Blues. So that's why I love when it's all tight, Who's the player that's going to be able to do that second or third effort? You know, who's able to go back 50 metres, get a steal within a big moment of a game? And both these teams have players that can do that. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how it all plays out. And I guess more so, you know, a guy like Wallace Atiti, he's one game away. You know, you have to really think with his performances, if he can have another performance like he did on the weekend, um, and a guy like him or guys that aren't proven, you really in the conversation of making a World Cup, of not making a World Cup, of making an all-back team. I think the midfield... Um, as well. Um, it's not all said and done there. So I think that battle of Rico Ioane and Anton Leonard Brown, which is, I, I reckon, the matchup of, of the game, especially in the wet. Um, the 13s are just so critical in defensive structures. Uh, so the, the battle of those two gets massive. And Cortez Ratana? Well, I genuinely think he's played himself into being that, that third nine. Now, there was, you know, we've talked around TJ Pedernada and Finlay Christie, who I think both guys are going to be there. But I think with Cortez and how he's played in big games in the last probably month, I think has warranted himself being that third nine. Now, there's Falao Fakatava, who probably hasn't been in a, um, in a strong team like Cortez. And Noah Hotham, probably with the way that he did finish, was in conversations. But look, I think what he has provided, his, his kicking game especially, I think um, the Chiefs have a little bit of a... 
um, two kind of kicking style with Cortez, being able to kick along with his left foot, but then also contestable games and knowing the international level and how important that is, the more times that he can put it on the money and being able to get that right, puts him in the best position to be able to do that. And he is the best supporting nine in the country. And knowing um, Scott Hansen and um, the qualities that he wants in his half the core roles are very, very important, and Cortez has done that within the last month. So, yeah, I've been really, really impressed with him. And, you know, look, if he can go out and have a performance against, you know, Finlay Christie, you know, two guys that were talking in and around, TJ Pedernado on the weekend, who he had a great game against, and you play um, a great game against a guy like uh, Finlay Christie, yes, you're in that third position, but look, you could give yourself to be able to have a crack, genuinely. Mm -hmm and being able to push those guys out with the warranted performance of in big game footy. So Razor, all that coaching staff have talked about, this is where we want to see. We, obviously it's not at the, um, the heights of a test match, but if you can play against players in this kind of forum, this, this, this kind of way, um, Cortez, I genuinely seriously think, gives himself a chance to play a little bit more than footy than we were probably thinking a month ago. It's All Blacks time. <sighs> Monday afternoon, Scott Robertson names his first squad, a 32-man squad out of Christchurch. It's a smaller squad, I think, than maybe would be named in the past for some of the home series. Mm. 32 men. Let's look into it. Bryn, where do you think are the key places that we need to look at for this squad? What are the places yep. which are, you know, there's conjecture over? Yeah, look, it's been tough. I think the, the, the 32 is so hard because obviously, you, you know, you're probably going to be a little bit less underdone in certain positions because it's, you know, a lot of utility is probably going to be used. But I think, you know, probably a couple of positions that I'm thinking is probably um, the third hooker and who's going to be selected if Samasoni isn't um, available um, with Amu and, and Cody Taylor. I think Ricky Riccatelli is a person that's, you know, put his hand up for a lot of years. And I think this year, especially, um, warrants to be able to, you know, be in conversation with that. You know, George Bell was talked about last year, but I think with maybe the introduction of Super Rugby, is he ready? Um, I'm not too sure, but Riccatelli, I think, has had a great season this year. The locks is something that I've really struggled to see where they're going to go with the injury of Paddy Tupelodi. I think if he was if he was available, you'd have a Scott Barrett, Tupo Vai, um, Patrick Tupelodi, and then obviously a guy that's been playing really well at Super Rugby. But because there isn't that experience, we're probably going to see guys that have played... Um, next to no internationals, but have played, I guess, um, All Black 15 in New Zealand Māori, um, given opportunity. So the locking stakes is, um, is one that I'm looking at. Also, I mean, for me, for myself, is, is the halfbacks. I think Cortez and Artemo will come in for that third position with the way that he's played. I think they're only going to select two tens. I think it's going to be Damien McKenzie and Bowden Barrett, uh, with, I think, how the squad makeup's going to be. And then lastly, will probably be the outsides and the, the mix of how many there are going to be, because I think there's obviously Talia, Reese. Uh, Caleb Clark's probably been in there, obviously, but I think Nana Saturu has had an outstanding year, and the ability of him to be able to cover wing and play fullback in the last couple of weeks with Sean Stevenson not being, being available, I think he's a guy that um, will be massive. And just hearing Leo McDonald's interview last night, thinking that um, they are going to, well, obviously he might be pulling our pants down a little bit here, but he did say that they were going to pick two two out and out 15s. Mm. So the likes of a Ruben Love and a Sean Stevenson, you know, they're probably two guys that I think are going to be that second 15. If Bowden Barrett, I believe, is going to be 15. And again, I don't know if they're going to take a third cover 10. Stephen Perifetta's in that conversation. David Harvilli, possibly, because, you know, he plays 10, 12, 15. And does he come into consideration along with the Billy Proctor, who's had a great season at 13? So a lot of areas that I think are really tough. I think the utility um, ability, I think, is going to be massive for that 31, 32, those last couple of positions at, at the moment. Um, I sort of felt my gut was thinking they would take... Um, Stevie, uh, Bowden, and Damien. And, and I sort of felt that Bodie would be the probably genuine first choice 15 man. He played he played some awesome footy and really owned it in the end towards the end of last year. Yes, he can play a 10, but you have to feel it's similar to when Richie was around. Damien needs to be on the field as well. So maybe it's um you know, one could play ten, one could play fifteen theoretically, but I think you know Bodie is um, you know, world class at 15 and 10, right. um, so it makes sense to have him there. I think Stevie deserves a genuine crack and more time in and around the environment to to sort of hone, hone his craft. And, and as we've seen with first fives, um, you know, a lot, lot leaving and um, one's injured, sabbaticals, that depth and that experience, all you need is one or two injuries um, and, and that depth and experience, um, yeah, can be tested and again. I stress he has performed extremely well in the 10 jersey at all that 15. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's done so, super rugby and he can see the number. So mm. I feel Stephen Pitterford has to be there. Um, and then I think the makeup of the back three is you're probably looking at focusing on wingers. 
and that potentially maybe up to cover uh, um, 15, but more your out and out wingers like uh, you know, Mark Tlea, on a Namasa Tulin, Caleb Clark, whoever it may be, um, to make up 32 for the Tulin's ones. I think the other area of print touched on is lock. Uh, I think potentially maybe they just named three um, and, and have the ability to think, you know, semi will maybe able to cover that due to its height and its efficiency at lock time because I don't know how they're going to squeeze that loose from a trio down. Um, I know I'm not giving a lot of answers here, but I've, I, I think that's the most exciting thing that the squad isn't predictable. Um, but, you know, does Sam Kane, you know, where's he? Is he, is he available? And you've got to think he's made the bulk of the tackles for that loose from trio for the last few years. He... He has played an important, uh, well, I suppose, thankless task. Um, and so the makeup of the uh, loose forward trio and the roles that they play uh, you know, it may differ if he's not there. Um, so, yeah, I've probably got more questions than answers. Um, but it's also, it, is, it, has, it has created a lot of excitement, I believe, in, in the naming, which hasn't been there for a while. And I think the unknown of these coaches, you know, we, I sort of don't know which way they're going to land. I think we'll see less lots more issues. Yeah, and I think you know we can't probably underestimate that there are there are 32 players that are going to be named, but there are going to be injury covers, and they will have probably you know two or three that will be travelling along with the squad because there are injuries, so they might be able to then pick pick from there. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, I agree with around the, the locks and being able to you know it's the loosest. That's probably the hardest thing for me. What that what that split's going to be? How do you choose out a Severe, Papali, Jacobson, Satutu, Blackadder, Wallace, Atiti, and Brandon, you also had Larkai, Duplessis, Griefy. You know, like, you know, like, man, it's, it's, it's just so hard. You, you don't know. Yeah. For me, you have to start at Sabir. Is he a seven or is he an eight? And once you've made that decision, you can build from there. Well, I think, Chip, you're, you're obviously a forward, but for me, you know, Savir would be, he's an eight. Who are you picking at seven and who are you picking at six? <laughs> man, this is the hardest position to, to do. Eh? Um, if I had to put you starting, yeah. Starting, I would go Severe, Papali'i, and I'd go Black Catter. Yeah. Black Catter at six. Black Catter at six. As far as line out options are concerned, is that, that becomes a little bit more difficult. It's not an out and out tall guy in the yep. loose forwards who's a, a proper line out option. Yeah, probably you just talked me out of that right now, isn't it? Because I think you're right. The line out option is important. Um, if it's not if it's not a black hatter, then you know Jacobson and I feel like Jacobson and Black Hatter are going up against each other. I think they um, are really good in and around six seven. They can cover multiple positions, have a pretty similar game in and around the physicality breakdown and being able to have a big engine. They both have those those traits. Now I don't know if they're going to select both of them because if you've got similar traits and you're probably better off maybe having a female, you know, a Samasoni female who has that kind of line-out option, and Hoskins Satutu obviously is a number eight, Cullen Grace or Ayose, they can jump in a line-out. Um, but on that note, I'd just have to go, maybe it'd be a Savir, Papali, and then a female for that line-out experience that you are talking about, if they don't think that they can cover that with Savir, Papali, and Blackadder at six. That's been my thinking, to try and at least get some clarity around how this loose forward's going to be picked. Yeah, well, I mean, the way I'd see it is, and you know, I'm putting my theoretical coach hat here, yeah. Um, the reason why Hardy has become the best player in the world is because we've allowed him to play to his strengths, which, are, which is his ball carrier's power game. Um, if you put him at seven, he's going to have to make a hell of a lot more tackles, and, and I don't think that's necessarily smart. You know, he's become the best player in the world at number eight. He's a number eight that can move to seven um, later on the game. But the more times we can have his tank fresh so that he can have those big moments, the better. That's why I sort of mentioned Sam Kane. You know, if he's fit and healthy, is is there a transition period? Um, you know, with with him ever, ever knowing that he's making on next year, or is it just ripped the bandaid off? Um, and you know, comes from Upper Lee, uh, Black and uh, Jacobson um, you know, fills that role at seven, even potentially a Peter Lafay. Uh, so I think first things first, to answer your question. So I think names. I, I just feel like having Savir at seven opens up your options for a better balanced loose ball trio. You know, you, you've got to have a big carrot ball carrier at number eight who is kind of more of an international ball carrier size, and then you can have an out and out line out wide ball carrier at six. I feel like you hold yourself back by having him at eight in a lot of ways. You know, I, I feel as a, a balanced loose yeah. ball trio, it feels better with him at seven to me. 
Yeah, look, I, th I think it is. Look, it's, a, it's a valid point. If you want to go through that theory, then you obviously have severe there. Then you can have a six and eight that can have their line. Oh, Hoskins Tutu, who has a great line out of Billy, is an example, who I think is the second best eight at the moment throughout this year. So, mm. yeah, to answer your question, I don't, I don't know. Who do you? Who do you think? I look. I think who would I pick? Yep. Who would I pick? I would pick uh, Savier at seven. I'd pick Satutu to start with at eight, as an out and out eight, and I'd pick Summer Penny Finau at six. six as a hard running, hard tackling, outside channel, yep. line out winning option. And then I'd look to the bench and you look at Black Attic and play all three positions. Mm -hmm. And maybe that allows you to have a person like Satiti or Yose who can come in as an impact ball carrying player yep. later on in the game. So you're thinking maybe then a six two split. A six, on a bench, a 6 possibly. 2 split on the bench. Possibly. Give yourself a maximum impact and then rely on the fact that in your back line you've got lots of people who can play multiple yep. positions. You've got multiple first five fullbacks, you've got a second five who can play, you've got a centre who can play on the wing. They've got that pretty well covered. Yep. And you can say, OK, we'll have a backup halfback mm -hmm. and then an outside back who is... Can cover just, multiple positions. Yeah, yeah, yep. you've got your Havili. Yep. Or someone along those lines. I feel like if you pick a Caleb Clark and a mm. Talair, you can play them for 80 minutes, you can have maximum impact, and then essentially just cover as you need to. Um, that would be my take. But like you say, it's impossible. That's pretty good clarity, <laughs> man. Like, honestly, that was actually pretty good. Like, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, it makes so, a lot of sense. Well, because when I looked at it and I sat down this morning and I was like, okay, how many props do you have? How many hookers do you have? How many locks do you have? How many looses do you have? It became really difficult with all of the trade-offs, yep. but when push comes to shove, the loose forwards is where your genuine impact is outside of those guys who are gonna play plenty, especially if you've got a Scott Barrett who can play 80, yep. you know, and, and has a massive engine on him. Yep. You've got that ability, Vai, he's an 80 minute player too. Yep. So maybe it's you, you move to that loose forward and like you say, if you've got a lock that goes down, you've got a female yep. as well who can maybe slot in there if you end up in some sort of trouble during the game yep. and you can move that around. So that's where I'd come from. Yeah. And also, I don't think this will happen because we don't have the depth at this stage, but you know, a Scott Barrett and a Tupo Vi could possibly play six as well. Yeah. But we, I don't think we need, we need, we probably need them to be locks with obviously the injuries to Patty. But I think if Patty was back, you know, then there could be that question, does Scott cover a mm. six? A six role, do you know what I mean? And he has in the past. And he has. Done it fairly well. Yes. My only problem with only flicking three locks yep. is that we're at a position where you've got very little experience. <laughs> Barrett has got a lot of international experience. Vai has mixed experience in big games. Yep. He only comes off the bench every now and then in big games because we've had that big three locks. Mm. He's been a real support player. So then if you lose both of those guys to injury and you don't spend time during this next month, giving Wakalia Were and Darry some time, yep. you're going to get to the Rugby Championship and you're going to be up shit creek. At least to say a few positions won't change this week. Like, and my gut says you'd have to think Saya Walker, Leo Rari would get that third locking spot. Um, but who's to say Sam Darry doesn't have a big game and forces his way in there? I think it's the same at number eight. Like, you know, Hoskins, is, is, he seems very focused even when he's, he's player of the match and defeated after the game last week. He was like, the job's not done, you know. He just seems very zoned in. He knows he needs another big performance because he's the big difference between the Blues winning and losing this season. And he knows that the responsibility rests on him for that team. But also, if he gets that right, um, you know, that selection, uh, you know, he will be there. And you know, well, Satiti, I think, you know, before I thought he may get some apprenticeship time or something, but well, he puts another shift into like that. And, uh, you know, he's definitely knocking on the door and saying that. Yeah, he wants to take on it. Hey, Captaincy, there appear to be two contenders. Scott Barrett is one, considering his time at the Crusaders has been very successful. Adi Savia is another, considering he is the World Player of the Year and has been a leader within the Hurricanes environment and a vice captain of the All Blacks along the way. Which way do they go? Oh, it's really tough, I think. You know, collectively, those coaches will know what, what they'll want to see um, as a captain, but I think first and foremost, as a captain, you've got to be selected first in that team. You're, you're known and you're always going to be on the field, you know. So, you know, probably Scott and, and Adi live to that kind of mantra of like, you know, as a New Zealand player, they're going to be on the on the field. I think both of them are world class. Obviously, Adi Sevilla has just become the best player in the world and he's been doing it for a very long time. Scott, I think, is getting to that stage now where he's the premier lock with Brody Retallick and um, Sam Whitelock on and he has shown some really good um, growth in the international level and at the Super Rugby level. And I just think it's going to come down as well to, I think, you know, winning is really, really important and being able to be adaptable. 
And I think having, you know, you look at Richie McCaw, Ke um, Kieran Reid, and obviously Sam Kane were selected. The guys that have really good adaptability and understanding situationally, um, what's required to, to win games and being comfortable, being uncomfortable in, in tight situations is a big part of, of being captain. So, so who would you pick? I, I actually don't, I don't, I don't know because I don't, I don't know. I know I, uh, I haven't had the chance to be able to be captain from Artie, but I know from all accounts from the guys that have been in that environment, he's has a big part in that environment and he's the World Player of the Year. He's captain the All Blacks before, um, so he could obviously do that and, and I've obviously been captain under Scott Barrett. Great man, um, has some great leadership qualities and is getting better at the international level. So I actually can't answer it, Ross. Okay, okay. I let can't me, actually answer it. Let Ross, me change the question there. I can't who answer you, it. Who do you think they will pick? Well, you can't go past Scott, can't you? Yeah. Look, Razor's, you know, obviously the been his, he's been his captain at the Crusaders. Um, he knows him as a, as a person. Um, but you can't take away from what Artie's done as well. Artie has a big um, a big positiveness in and around that all, all black environment and what he's done with that leadership group and that team. So with whatever way they do go, like they're both two great candidates. I just think just knowing Razor and probably, you know, the only reason why I'd say that is because he's picked him as captain at the Crusaders. Yeah. But two great leaders. Jip, take the head off me, mate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't <laughs> pick it, mate. I actually can't <laughs> pick it. So who do you reckon? Uh, hey, Bruno, can I just ask a question? I was just having a think while you were talking there. Um, did Razor ever pick co-captains for the Crusaders? Or did he always go an out and out captain? Um, no, he'd go all in, yeah, always an out and out captain. I think the only time he did a co captain was when I think Sam was in, Sam was in Japan and it might have been Davey, Davey and Cody mm. that might have been co captains, but yeah, I can't imagine him going co captains. But if he could, if he did, but like you can did do he that. Did he pick an off the field captain as well as an on the field captain? I remember reading about that. Was there a person who did more of the leadership off the field in order to take the pressure off the captain on the field? Oh, look, I just think Sam did that just naturally. Right. I think knowing what his ability was to be able to get, you know, Get the best out of the group and had a real good um, understanding and grasp of what was what was required to take the it took the pressure off Scott and probably Scott, you know, when he first was captain, Sam had, had all that experience. Probably the reason why it was given to him is because Sam went off to Japan and so it's like right here's a good chance to be able to build Scott as a captain and where he's got a lot better in that space within the last three years being with that group. But um, yeah, to answer your question in and around that, it was more so Scott. No, it's been able to take the pressure off you know your leaders in other areas. And it wasn't just like Sam Whitelock, but other players get times. Cody Taylor, David Harvilli were able to talk to Razor and take the pressure off Scott or whoever was the captain at the time to be able to try and get the, be the best out of them. And then I guess um, take the responsibility away from the captain off the field. Okay, Jip, you're in the firing line, mate. Who would you pick and who do you think they'll pick? I know one thing that is extremely important with a captain is that captain-coach relationship. So um, I suppose competitions or spots would suggest, um, you know, Scott might have the inside running uh, because he's obviously got that relationship. But then understanding Jason Holland has that relationship with Arnie as well. And I don't think you can factor out Cody either, but you've got to think with that explosive power that potentially come off the bench, um, you know, you, you probably don't want to move and you kept him. Uh, so then, you know, logic would tell me it's either Scott or Hardy or both. Some good fence sitting here, guys. Hold on. It, it's not fence sitting because I genuinely do think, like, Razor's always been different. He, he sees things differently. And the idea of co captaincy for the All Blacks doesn't seem right because history says it should be one person. Um, there's one thing I've learned, um, I suppose, from afar, Bryn will know it better than me. Um, he leaves no stone unturned if he thinks. Um, you know, there's, there's a potential that that gets the best out of the group. I, I see no reason why it can't happen. Yeah, a lot of questions. Just bring on. When's the date? The 24th. Uh, yeah, yeah, the 24th. Monday, 24th. Monday, 24th. And, and make sure that you tune in to us. We'll be doing our show that night afterwards. Um, so we'll have a reaction and hopefully we'll have an all-black coach on the show next week for a bit of reaction to it. We'll also next week be sitting down like we did last year, doing a bunch of interviews with all-blacks players the day after and slowly sprinkling them out in our show over the international season. So you get to know these players and what makes them up a little bit more. Now, as promised, throughout the season, the tipping comp winner would get a spot on the show. We had the bloke on last year. Um, was awesome value, so we've done it again this year. And this year's winner is Nick Horton, a.k.a. Kane's in Exile. <laughs>
A Lions and Canes fan, we're not going to hold that against him. Uh, tough weekend for Nick, so we might need to help him through the, sh the next little part of the show. But Nick, thank you very much for joining us, mate. Uh, appreciate it. Tough game on Saturday for Thank your you very team. much for having me. Tough weekend for the Hurricanes, unfortunately, but uh, good experience and stand us in good stead for next year, I guess. Both the Chiefs and the Blues have done recently, so... That's why they're probably in the in the big final. Congratulations for winning the tournament. I was absolutely horrific this year, alongside with probably Jipper and Ross. <laughs> Tell us what your secret was. There was obviously 50-50 games. The Hurricanes, you probably would have picked in a lot of the games, but was there any kind of reasons or anything that you had around picking teams to get the results? Yeah, I think a couple of things. First of all, this year, perhaps more than the last couple of years, the home advantage has been really crucial. And so I've tended to pick um, teams that, that were playing at home. You've seen a number of the Australian teams, obviously the Brumbies, but the Reds and maybe even the Force, hard to beat at home, as well as the draw, obviously, in Fiji. Um, so I tended to pick from home. Um, tended not to get too caught up in some of the stories about uh, some of the hard luck cases. And then um, probably what stood me in good stead this year, but has failed me in previous years, is I'd always pick the Canes and never pick the Crusaders. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that one. I was waiting for that one. Yeah. I've probably gone the other way this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, so. you, you'd be sitting where he is. Yeah, I would be. No, but look where he is. Nick's right there. So, yeah, should have gone, gone, with, gone with him this year. I, like, I really struggled with the Rebels and Wine of Pacifica. I just kept on jumping, chopping and changing with them every week every time I went the other way they'd win and then obviously when I when I when I back them they'd lose were there any niggly teams you felt that that probably caused you the most headaches um probably those guys I mean there was a sort of a bunch of teams around the eight nine ten area that you just weren't really sure who was going to turn up every week and the rebels I think especially with that they started the season so well um, but then I guess got more into the New Zealand teams at the back end of the season and and the wheels kind of came off for them so yeah they were pretty tough I think I got better as the season went on and 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 the draw made it a bit easier perhaps you're a Kiwi but you're Sydney based so you probably got a unique insight into Aussie rugby culture to some degree. Well, what have you seen yep. over there about, I suppose, the differences between home and there and how rugby works and maybe why they're just not pulling it over a long period of time? Yeah, I mean, everyone knows about how competitive the market is here with the NRL and the AFL and so forth. But I think more fundamental than that, Australia has an identity crisis with their rugby. Um, the provincial union set up is pretty much the same as maybe what we're struggling with in New Zealand at the moment and they haven't really got to the point where they actually need to face up to some of these governance issues which I think is a real drag on them um, but fundamentally you know I think they the club game's strong but actually building a foundation to make better super rugby teams and then obviously a better wallabies isn't really there they haven't worked that out so maybe someone like David Nusafora coming in is going to make a big difference I went to I've got a mate who's a um, Waratah season holder a season ticket holder and went to probably about five or six Waratahs games this year you're getting good crowds on a Friday night at Sydney it's a fantastic stadium um, but the Waratahs will perform in patches and then fall away and I feel like a lot of the Australian teams are like that they have good moments. They've obviously got talented players. They just don't seem to be able to, at a super rugby level, maybe also at a Wallabies level, maintain the concentration for 80 minutes that the top New Zealand teams can. So that's kind of where I think they really let themselves down. Now, has the uh, Australian public taken the news of Carter Gordon signing in the NRL? That must, well, caught me by surprise on saying this talent leaving. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, talking to a couple of my sort of Aussie rugby loving mates here, they're all really disappointed that money's been spent on, you know, NRL players that are probably unproven in rugby and you can't retain someone like Carter Gordon, who to me, you should be looking with him and maybe Noah Lolaseo to build a team around. They obviously offer different things and kind of depends on which way the, the coach wants to go. But, you know, to, to lose a player of, of that, you know, calibre and, and potential, I think, just really underlines how disorganised and um, how where there's a real lack of cohesion and maybe a lack of communication within Australian rugby. Um, because the Rebels folding, they should have been all hands on deck to try and retain him. The other thing that I heard is that the um, Australian Rugby Union were very keen to get Gordon to move to uh, the Waratahs. He wanted to return home to Queensland. He's a Queenslander. Um, and maybe that that had a role in the in the decision as well.
Yeah. Because I think just on that, I think we've always agreed that probably five teams is too much for them. Mm. But now that it's going to be four, and if they can disperse these players into certain um, teams like the Force or the Reds or whoever it may be, I think we're probably going to see more improved um, Australian Super Rugby teams because I think there has been growth this year, especially with the results and competitiveness. And we've talked around it a lot, being able to be for Super Rugby Pacific to be better, the Australian teams need to be competitive. So it'll be interesting to see, Nick, um, if you think that's going to be something they, they should do. Yeah, I, th I think they definitely should because, you know, aside maybe from the Brumbies, the bench strength of the Australian teams mm. hasn't been great. And so, you know, by dispersing the the, the Rebels players amongst the other four um, teams, that should definitely, I mean, obviously a lot of them would be starters, but definitely add to the bench strength. And I think, you know, you've seen with the Waratahs, once they got a couple of prop injuries, they were just pulling guys out of shoot shield. And with all due respect to them, you know, they're trying really hard, but they're just not of super rugby caliber yet. And, you know, if you can't scrum, then you're in deep trouble. So bringing a guy maybe like Tani Tupo into the Waratahs, I think, um, means that they should have a great starting front row with um, Pariki and, and, and Angus Bell, and then a couple of quality uh, backups as well. So hopefully, you know, with the demise of the Rebels, that will raise the standard of all of them, but just by basically creating better squads, I think. And just, just what you said there, I'm just thinking, because they've gone to four teams so late, mm. do you reckon all the contracts were taken up and, and there wasn't that much money and, and I suppose the other teams to offer Carter what he probably thought he was worth? The talks might have been too fast, and a guy like Carter Gordon is going to get offered, what, you know, half a million to 600k at a, at a, at a league, um, in a league team. You know, it's pretty hard for him not to be able to turn that down. So not only Carter Gordon, but I think, you know, a lot of players in, those, in that position probably just haven't had the time. So, yeah, it's, it's tough for Australian rugby, but you'd have to think, you know, hopefully, like I said, if they can be dispersed and, I guess, out to different teams, then like Nick said, I think the depth in Australian rugby would be a lot better knowing that, you know, 30 to 40 odd a contract, the guys from the Rebels, will be going to other Super Rugby teams in Australia. OK, let's get on to the tipping for the weekend then. Uh, there's only three games to really look at, Nick. Let's start with the final. Any chance at all that yeah, you think so, the Chiefs could go and win that? Uh, you have to say with the way that they, they played against the Hurricanes, if they can bring that same sort of game plan against the Blues, they'll, they'll be in with a chance. Um, however, I think the Blues' home advantage is going to be decisive. And just the way... I mean, you saw the way the Blues just went to work against the Brumbies, the forwards rolling their sleeves up. Even without um, Paddy Tuopolotu, they were hugely impressive. And I think uh, it's going to be a big, long afternoon for the Chiefs forward pack, but the Blues to come out on top. You know, Jipper agrees. Very true. Um, no, I think it's going to be close as well, but obviously I'm not going to waste everyone's time and try and pretend I'm picking the Chiefs. I'll, I'll, I'll be back in the Blues this weekend. Okay, bro. I did say I did say Ross that you know the Chiefs if they got themselves into a final I thought you know that would be probably the only the one of the teams with obviously them beating the Hurricanes away in Wellington, um, but I just think with how the how the Blues are playing um, their forward pack and the way that they pretty much controlled that game for a long period of time especially in the first half against the Brumbies um, it's pretty hard to see that they aren't going to get it right even if it is raining Harry Plummer has had some great tactical kicking along with long kicks being able to do contestables Finlay Christie's plotted in really well um, coming back from injury so yeah I'm probably going to go for the Blues but I would not be surprised with the Chiefs just knowing playing them in finals and I guess what is going to be driven throughout the week through Clayton and um, Roger Randall and they'll be going coming up here knowing that it's uh, um, they aren't the favourites all the pressure is going to be on the Blues and so they'll be boiling in and around um, some messages to see that they're going to go up to Eden Park and I guess do something to very similar what the Crusaders did not too long ago going up there and trying to win a final mm. Eden, Eden Park but I think the Blues are a lot better placed considering with how their forward pack's been the whole year, and um, they'll be looking to that forward pack to try and get them over the over the line this week against the Chiefs. The Blue, I mean, you know very well the Blues have lost a final at home in recent times. You know? Yeah, but I think I think they're, they're in a better spot. I think the way that they are playing, um, it's a lot different to where they were probably two years ago. I think what Vern Cotter's come in and he's done, Nick um, and Jipper have talked about it, like what they've done throughout the whole year, it wins competitions. Their set piece, um, the way that they brutally beat people up in and around the 22 area, their tackle efficiencies in the high 90s. So all those areas that you need for, to win to win finals, the Blues are doing that. Now, the challenge is, can they do it? Because you look at the Hurricanes, who we thought would have a big advantage uh, playing in Wellington, you get out to an early start, 
and you're 17 points down early on, then you know it's about adapting on the run. And you know the Blues have shown that this year, but you never know when it comes to a final what the Chiefs can do. And if they play like they did on the weekend, they've got every good, uh, very good chance of beating the Blues up in Eden Park. Right, two other games this weekend: South Africa versus Wales in a window that doesn't really align with anyone being available at all. The box have got no Europe, UK, Ireland-based players, or anyone out of the Bulls who are hosting the URC final, <laughs> and the Welsh have got no English-based players. A bunch of injuries, and obviously all those experienced guys who retired at the end of last year. So this is a bit of a wild card game in some ways, a development game. Nick, have you looked into this? What are you thinking? Yes, yeah, really tough one to pick. I, I'm going to go South Africa simply because I think they've got you know a lot of guys now playing in Japan, as Bryn will know, and they're coming out of coming out of their season. They're going to be in good form, um, so they've probably got an advantage compared to the Welsh guys that are available that have come out of a very long. Um, European season after the World Cup, so I'm going to go with the world champs. Oh, mate, it's a uh, city side with Malcolm Marks is, is going to get the tip of the, the cat for me, so oh, I actually think it's a very, very strong side, um, to be honest. With you. I know they are missing some key players, mate. It's a lot of World Cup winners, a lot of experience, and as Nick sort of alluded to, that a lot of the players came from Japan, they play a lot of footy, so they'll be fresh. Mm -hmm. The one person out is Lord Diyaka. Um, who was pretty good this season by the sounds of it in Japan. But yep. outside of that, um, on paper, Bryn, do you agree it's all box? Yeah, I think so. Look, being at home as well, I think it's always it's always tough to, you know, to win in South Africa. And I think even though, you know, a lot of those players are, you know, have the opportunity to play in South Africa, I think, you know, on the back of winning a Rugby World Cup, those Japanese players that um, have had a bit of a long break will be we were raring to go with along with them being in um, some long term injuries as well. But then I think also anytime you see a Springbok team, you know, more like to the All Blacks, it doesn't matter who's in that jersey. They have a lot of passion. Jip, I am interested in your thoughts on the timing of these games. I mean, they are crossing with competitions. There's all sorts of unavailable players. Is it a good thing to do this or a bad thing to do this? Um, well, initially when I saw the South African Welsh game, um, Fiji Barbarians doesn't really bother, bother me because, you know, it is a festival fixture, but when it's actual test matches, but... And when you go through the squad of South Africa, it's going to be a pretty strong team. So I don't believe that squad is a development side. There's a lot of experience in there and then obviously opportunity for a few others. But the Welsh side, I mean, is probably the most concerning because a lot of their players aren't available and it is more of a development team. But, I, you know, like they obviously, from a monetary point of view, you're not going to probably draw as many people as, it's, say, an A team. Um, so... You can see sort of why they've kept it that way, but does it make sense? Probably not. Um, and I suppose it's another point yet again to the global calendar. Mm, mm, mm. Does it devalue Test Rugby or does it help make Test Rugby better by giving more players experience so that Test matches to come turn out to be better across the board? Well, I was just going to say that's probably the one good thing about it, right? Um, obviously, the, the the international window that we have, these kind of problems tend to happen quite a lot, but it does give guys opportunities. Like, there's 12 new guys that are in that squad for the South Africans and there's some more in the Welsh and, you know, whether it may be with the Fijian Drua, the guys that are going to get opportunities in, that, in this window as well. So you get an opportunity to play for your country. Like, Jip knows you've been able to be an international player. Anytime you get to put on that jersey and you're able to have a chance to be able to stake your claim for a rugby championship even at the end of your tour um, you're able to do that so um, yeah, you're probably on the, the same line same line lines there Jipper yeah yeah I am and I, I was just thinking then like some nations might have seen the Springboks over the last four year cycle and see how often they did provide opportunity for the next tier of players and how I suppose invaluable that's been come real cup time so maybe it might be a strategy yeah. um, that the Welsh are trying to employ and um, you know, you've got to say good on them for trying to turn things up because something's going to change if they want to get the results. Thereafter, I don't think you're ever going to see a New Zealand side to be able to do that. And I think that's why yeah. we do have a strong sort of Māori All Blacks and All Blacks 15 programming to allow for that um, development as well and not be forgotten. Well, Nick, thank you very much for joining us today. Mate, awesome. incredible knowledge. Um, would you like a spot on the show permanently? <laughs> <laughs> Look, guys, thank you very much for having me. And thank you also every week. Love listening to the podcast. So really appreciate the opportunity to come on and chat with you all. Thank you. Great. And of course, James Parsons uh, down at the airport. Whereabouts are you at the airport, Chipper? Yeah, just in uh, the humble Koru Lounge <laughs> in Christchurch, actually, in, uh, in Bryn's territory. All right. Have you filled the plate? So, uh, how full is your so plate? You in the, have you filled the plate in the Koru Lounge? You've... Are you, are you one of those people who tucks in or are you one of those people who just kind of flows through? I've eaten this a thousand times before. <laughs>
Yeah, no, it's not so much the food, but the coffee's get a good nudge. <laughs> you can actually see he his pupils are Chip, dilated, Chip, actually. Chip does love a coffee in the old Kuru Lounge. Been able to travel with him a lot, so... <laughs> you forget anyone on boarding, won't you, boy? <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm just hanging out for you guys to talk for five minutes. I'll nip off and grab one <laughs> yeah. off screen. His phone's actually pinged three times telling him that it's ready just yeah. in that last yeah. couple of minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Brent, great to have you in studio once again as well. Awesome. And thank you very much for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Please send us an email, aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz. Comment in the YouTube comments section. Of course, you can catch us on Sky Sports platforms, on Sky Sports YouTube. You can catch segments of the show on Rugby Pass's YouTube as well as on Rugby Pass TV. Thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Matewa.